the book of Daniel, and go to Daniel chapter 5, if you would. If you find your place there in the book of Daniel, I'm going to read a text there from these first few verses. Now, Daniel is a prophetic book, and there's much prophetic information in the book of Daniel, a great study, but I want to look at a practical message from that book this morning that hopefully will challenge our heart. And so we'll give you a few moments to find that place, and then we'll begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll read the text. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity this morning to be in this service, and certainly a blessing that we can open up the Word of God and look to the Holy Spirit to speak to our heart. We pray that in these moments, the Lord Jesus Christ would be lifted up and that he would draw people to himself. We pray for every believer to be edified. We thank you that we can this morning look to you to work in our midst, and we thank you for what you'll do in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll notice down in Daniel chapter 5, it begins in verse 1, and Belshazzar, the king, made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. Belshazzar, while he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple which was in Jerusalem, that the king and his princes, his wives, and his concubines might drink therein. Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem, and the king and his princes and his wives and his concubines drank in them. They drank wine, they praised gods of gold and of silver and of brass and of iron, of wood and of stone. In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance was changed and his thoughts troubled him. So the joints of his loins were loosed and his knees smote one against another. And I suspect your response could have been very similar had you seen a hand with no arm, no body, simply hovering in the sky and writing on the wall. And of course, from that, we get that old saying, the handwriting is on the wall. Now, this account is not a myth and it's not a fable. This is literally a message from God to a heathen king who had turned his nose from God, snubbed him up, said, I'll take your old holy vessels, uh, have a party with them. Uh, praise the gods of gold, gods of silver, but the thumb his nose unto the God of heaven, and God sent him a message. Now let me remind you of the context, because it is important to remember that in uh, Babylon, of course, Nebuchadnezzar has passed off the scene, and his son Nabonidus, who is not mentioned in this passage, is really uh, the king of Babylon, but he has gone off in a distant war that he is fighting, and he has left Belshazzar, his son, basically ruler of the city of Babylon. The city of Babylon, of course, was a fortress. It was an impregnable city. It pertained one of the seven wonders of the world. There were walls around it that were wide enough that multiple chariots could ride around the wall of it. Um, there was only certain places you could enter that wall. And, of course, above that there were uh, defenses such as hot boiling oil and so forth. They had their own food source, their own water source. Uh, the whole population could live within the walls of this city, and nobody could touch them. Well, Belshazzar, of course, being in this city, feeling that there was nobody who could cause him any harm, literally at this time, it was not a, 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 a mystery to them. They knew that the armies of the Media Persian Empire was gathered around this city, miles around it, because it was a massive city, they were waiting for an opportunity to come in, but essentially inside, Belshazzar said, nobody can come in. I mean, there's no way to get in. We have this, these walls, they're high, they're broad, there's no way to get in the gate, and truly that was the case. No army was going to enter those gates, it was too fortified, the city was impenetrable, and so he felt fairly safe, and he said, let them gather around, they're not going to cause any trouble. Soon the armies of Nabonidus will be back and we'll take care of it. But in the meantime, we're going to throw a party. Now this man had no regard, of course, for the God of heaven. You'll remember Babylon now has taken the, the people of Israel into captivity. We're coming toward the end of that time that they would stay there. But they had gone in, destroyed the temple, took all the vessels and so forth, and had kept them in storage. And now Belshazzar sits around and perhaps thinks to himself, how can I show God exactly what I think of him? Well, God has a message for him. 
He sends the fingers of a man's hand. It's simply a, a sign to get his attention. Simply something there to show them that he's serious. And this hand comes hovering right next to the light source, some type of a candle, and begins to etch words in the plaster. Well, the music stops. The party comes to a quick halt. Everybody stops as a hush goes over the crowd and they gape upon the wall and they see this great phenomenon take place. Belshazzar, who is supposed to be over in charge and of course the great king, stands there and you hear a little sound. It's a clicking sound. It's his knees knocking together as he realizes what's taking place is for him specifically. God gave him a message and the message was written and he could not discern the message. But you know, God has a message for us today. The message that he sent to him is given over at the end of this chapter. And you'll notice the words in verse 25. It says, this is the writing that was written. Many, many tekel you farsen. And this is the interpretation of the thing. Mene, God had numbered thy king and finished it. Tekel, thou art weighed in the balances and are found wanting. Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and to the Persians. Now God sends... Belshazzar a message and he doesn't immediately know what to do with the message but before the chapter ends it is very clear what God is trying to say but let me tell you that God has a message for this world today God has a message and it is a completed message and that is there is a savior who has gone to the cross there is one who has died for your sin who has come out of a grave who has raised again and invites you to receive him there is a message today to a lost world that there is a loving God who has sent His Son to save you, to keep you out of an everlasting eternity, separated from Him, and He sends His people, those that know Him, those that have received Him, with that message to a lost world. Now, we don't use fingers that hover in the air, and we don't have the etching on a plaster, but we've got a book that God has given us that shares the message of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the question is, what are you going to do with Him? Now, I noticed several aspects of that message that are very similar to the message that God sends today. If you'll notice, first of all, when I look at these first verses that we read, we notice that there's a feast. You know, the feast reminds us of a, of a party. It reminds us of an indulgence. It reminds us of a group of people who say, well, it's time to, uh, to get as much out as we can of the pleasures of life. Well, you know, there are plenty of pleasures in life. God allows us to enjoy some good things. The Bible says in Psalm 16 that at thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. God has been good. God has provided things. There's a time for laughter. There's a time for enjoying life. But you know, when the uh, army is gathering around your city and you're the leader and you're the one in charge, probably not the best time. But he felt comfortable. He felt as if nothing could happen. He felt like there's no way this could go wrong. But you know, the Bible tells us in Psalm 36, 1, the transgression of the wicked saith within my heart, there is no fear of God before their eyes. When you look at our world today, the people that do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, could you come to a conclusion that there's no fear of God before their eyes? Hey, when they take God's name and they curse out his name, use it in an irreverent way, could care less if they've just taken God's name and used the breath that he gave them to blow it back in his face, I'm con I would consider there's no fear of God before their eyes. When people today live a, a debauched lifestyle, they don't care who they run over, who they stomp in the process. They're selfish. They're self-focused. Uh, anybody gets in my way, I'll run over them. You would get the impression that they believe that there will never be consequences. There's no fear of God before their eyes. People harbor bitterness in their heart. They may not even get away with it necessarily, but inside they thought, boy, if I could do it, I would destroy that person as far as God's concerned, you did. And that bitterness is in their heart because there's no fear of God before their eyes. Of course, we see the sins of the flesh. Uh, they drink, take drugs. There's uh, jealousy, debate, envy. I mean, the world is a place where even people go so far as to commit mass murders. The transgression of the wicked saith within my heart, there's no fear of God before their eyes. But could it be even this morning? You know there's a God, and perhaps you have some regard for Him, but when it comes down to the message from God, would you turn a deaf ear and say, well, I think everything will be okay. I think it'll turn out all right. Belshazzar thought to himself, in a sense, well, what really could go wrong? We're in an impregnable city. What could go wrong? We're the greatest city on this earth. 
But you know the devil will convince people sometimes to think everything's fine. I'm okay. Everything will turn out all right. Even when a person is confronted with their soul, sometimes the thought comes, well, look, if I'm going to go to hell, everybody else is too. I mean, surely everybody can't be wrong. But you know the Bible says don't follow a multitude to do evil. You recognize this security that he had was completely unfounded because within hours his city is going to be destroyed. But you know, not only was it just an unfounded security, he had an unbridled irreverence. I mean, he drank uh, in these vessels. Now, he could have had his party. He could have had his party, and we could make an argument that his party was a drunken, revelrous feast, but we could say, well, he was a Gentile. He didn't really know much about God. He's simply following the course of life. I mean, yeah, they're going to drink it up. They're going to party a little bit. I mean, yeah, it's sin. It's wrong. But he went a little bit step further than that. He said, bring me the, uh, the, the vessels from the house of God. And you know, yes, there are people today who simply out of ignorance live a life of uh, lust and a life of drunkenness and a life of revelry. But the fact is, eventually it works itself back to idolatry. It works itself back that I'd rather have my sin than have God. You see, he praised the gods of silver and the gods of brass. But you know, the Bible says in Psalm 14, 1, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Now, I know there's plenty of folks who might would say this morning, well, I'm not an atheist. I believe there's a God. I believe God exists. But you know, notice the psalmist did not say that the fool says and believes it and knows it. He says it in his heart. It doesn't matter what he believes in his head. I don't think there's really any logically thinking people that are honest that would look and say there's got to be a God. I mean, how am I here? You can come up with any kind of evolutionary process. You can come up with some other type of incident. You want Big Bang, whatever it is. Somewhere down the line, you're going to have to say, I came from somewhere. And either some inanimate uh, life of, or an inanimate uh, non-living entity blew up and I became a man, or some all-wise, all-knowing person put me here. I mean, yes, logically we know there's a God, but that won't get you to heaven. Because when a man turns from God, he says in his heart, there is no God. Now, this man, Belshazzar, obviously, is a man who stands opposed to everything God stands for. He doesn't have any fear. He doesn't have any reverence. And you know, as he sits here that day, he had inexcusable ignorance. Think about for a moment, Nebuchadnezzar, his grandfather. Look over to verse uh, 21. God is giving him a message now from the prophet Daniel, and he reminds him of this. He says, Nebuchadnezzar, in verse 21, was driven from the sons of men. His heart was made like beast, and his dwelling was with the wild asses. They fed with him with the grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till he knew that the Most High God ruled in the kingdom of men, and that he appointed over it whomsoever he will. And thou his son, O Belshazzar, hast not humbled thine heart, and thou knewest all this. Do you remember Nebuchadnezzar? Nebuchadnezzar, of course, God had given him authority basically over the whole world. He had put Israel into captivity only because God was punishing his people. And he told Nebuchadnezzar, he warned him, he said, the day is coming if you don't get the pride out of your heart, judgment's going to fall. There was a day when Nebuchadnezzar walked out, though he had been warned, and he looked out at the great kingdom of Babylon, and he says, it's not this Babylon that basically I'm the God over. And God says, today's the day. And Nebuchadnezzar, for one solid year, lost his mind. He became, in his mind, a beast. He got out in the field. His hair grew like eagle's feathers. His fingernails grew out like claws. He grazed out in the backyard and ate grass like an oxen. They didn't, couldn't, he was still the king of Babylon, but he grazed around and they didn't know if he'd ever come back. And a year later... God gave him his mind back. And when he came out of that experience, he said, I know now who God is. I know there's a God in heaven, and I know I'm nobody, and he's everything. And if you read chapter 3, there's every indi indication that Nebuchadnezzar is in heaven today because he found God. But you know, Belshazzar knew all about it. He heard the story. I mean, everybody in Babylon knew about it. They knew Nebuchadnezzar got up and he decreed. He didn't just say it to his counselors. He decreed it to the whole city I have been an imbecile for a year. God got a hold of me, and you'd better bow before the God of heaven. And now the prophet says, Belshazzar, 
You knew all about it, but you didn't listen. You know, that was absolutely inexcusable ignorance on the part of him for the same God that put his grandfather out in the field. He said, I'll show you what I think about God. Bring out the wine and put it in the golden vessels. What do you think about this, Jehovah? Let's toast one to God and tell him what we think about it. And then the fingers show up. So the first thing, you got a feast. But then let's think about for a moment this finger. Now this finger of a man's hand comes out. We read this in verse 5. In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand that wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. You know, the first thing I note about this hand is when the hand began to write, Belshazzar had to listen. Now, he didn't do what it said. He didn't respond correctly, but it got his attention. You say, well, if I was sitting in a room, and I mean, here we are having a party, and a hand begins to float, you might think it's a trick or some kind of illusion. But when you realize that <clears throat> there's a message there, boy, I'd sure listen to that. But let me tell you, when God gives you this book, you'll know it's the truth. Listen, there are plenty of folks who have turned down the gospel but they knew in their heart when they heard it, they said, look, I'm not going to receive it. I'm not going to change. I'm not going to take Jesus. I'm not going to do what I'm supposed to do. But they know in their heart it is the truth. You know, the Bible says in Isaiah 55, 11, that my word shall not return unto me void. It's going to accomplish that which I please and prosper in the thing wherein I sent it. God's word has never come back to him void. Listen, a person may be of great authority. They may have great physical ability. They might have a bunch of money. They might have political clout. But they're not greater than this book. You understand, we don't have to defend it ourselves. We contend for it. God sends this word forth, and it's not just a compilation of a bunch of stories. It's not just a bunch of things that some men gave their opinion about God. This is literally the word of God. You say, well, why don't you prove it to me that it's God's word? You know what? I think I'll just let God do that. And he can. When you hear the Word of God, you can't put your finger on it. You don't know why, but God puts His stamp of approval on this book. Nobody had to convince Belshazzar that day when he saw that scratching. He knew the message was for him. He didn't say, oh, well, there's another message from God, but I'm not interested. God showed him that it was His, and it scared him. You know, there's plenty of folks who know what this book says, and they don't like to think about it. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to know it, because when they think about it, it causes them to fear. Well, you know what God's doing by getting a hold of your heart and bringing fear is leading you to himself. Now, he can call you to repentance, but when the word of God is preached, there's going to be an effect. Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. It's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. I mean, when that scratch came in that plaster and he saw what God had to say, even though he didn't know what it meant, he said, boy, God's got something for me and I sure wish it would go away. I just wish I could ignore it. Do you know if you want to ignore God's words, you can, but it's still going to have an effect. You still got to answer for it. I mean, it calls his knees to smite together. He recognized something there is telling there was a demand God's word must be responded to. You've got to either respond yes or you got to respond no. Well, after he had this demand, notice the desperation. Look at verse 7. The king cried aloud. As soon as the words were up there, nobody knew what it meant. The king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. And the king spake and said to the wise men of Babylon, Whosoever shall read this writing and show me the interpretation thereof shall be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold about his neck, and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Now, the third ruler, of course, Nabonidus being first, Belshazzar was next, and then, of course, he was going to put this man as basically the prime minister, if he could do it. So he called for the astrologers and the Chaldeans and the soothsayers. He looked for the smartest people he knew to try to tell him something that God already wanted to tell him. Now, if he'd have stopped for a moment, he could have stopped and said, what is God trying to say? But he tried in desperation to see what it meant. You know, if you're saved, you read this book, and you turn over and you turn to a passage. Uh, the Bible says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. 
that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You're saved. You've read the Bible. You say, well, that's pretty simple. God loves the world. He sent his son Jesus to die. Jesus rose again and offers an invitation that if anybody would believe in him, they could be saved. If they reject him, they're going to be lost. I mean, that's pretty simple. Now, the world academically may catch part of that, but they miss it. They don't get it. I'll tell you how I know they don't get it, because you ask the average person on the street who doesn't know Jesus, do you know for sure you're going to heaven? Well, I hope so. I think so. I'm doing the best I can. I'm going to try. Maybe I can, or maybe they just outright say, no, I'm not going. Why? And their answer inevitably is not going to be because I've absolutely turned down Jesus. I won't receive him. Their answer is always, if, you, if they think they are going, I've tried to live a good life. I try to be a good person. I try to go to church. I do the best I can. I'm not as bad as my neighbor. I mean, the answers go on and on. Now, wait a minute. The Bible clearly said right here that believing in Jesus is the only way you can go. You saw it, academically you get it, but then when I ask you, because I've done this, I've done this, I've done this. You see, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness unto him. So let me tell you what man does. Just like Belshazzar, he becomes desperate. He starts looking for some way that he can find truth and find peace. Now that's a noble search. I want to find peace in my heart. I want to know that I'm right with God. So maybe they even search out the Chaldeans and the astrologers. You know, it's funny that people claim to be educated. If you bring up the fact, I'll just use this as a for instance, that a finger of a man's hand scratched on the plaster. Some educated, propagandized uh, person thinks to themselves, oh, wow, that ignorant preacher up there actually thinks that really took place. I mean, which doesn't matter to me. I'm, I'm fine with you believing that. Uh, he, he probably thinks Jonah really got swallowed by a whale. And Jesus actually fed 5,000 people off a handful of fishes and really opened some blinded eyes or whatever it might be. I mean, really, to think that that actually happened, these people are not educated. They're backwood, behind the scenes. How could people that are educated believe that? And then the next day, they'll go online and pull out their horoscope app. And, oh, man, today's my day. The stars are aligned just right for me. I believe the aura that's around me today is going to make me, and by the time they're looking at it, they get in a car wreck. Okay, so it didn't turn out too well, did it? You understand your horoscope and your psychic network. Somebody calls up a psychic. Now, maybe we're not two of us that far gone, but a few people are. You call up the psychic, and you're kind of apprehensive about it, wondering if it's really true or real. Well, yeah, um, my name is... Uh, you know, Bob Smith. Oh, Bob, wait a minute. Hold on a second. I see something. Bob, I believe you have had financial difficulty. Wow. How'd you know that? I believe you've had trouble with relationships in your life. Man, you're good. How'd you come up with that? Who, you wouldn't have called if you hadn't had financial trouble and trouble in your relationships. They don't know any more than anybody else, but they're good. Now, my point is people will listen to that but they won't listen to the Bible. This book's been around a lot longer than any of those folks. This book has been changing lives, been making new creatures in Christ, transform civilizations, give people direction in their life, but just like in desperation, how can I get peace? I need a help group. I need some kind of therapy. I mean, look, all that stuff is fine in its place, but you'll not get peace with God through a therapist, through some kind of a regulation, through some kind of a help group. You only get peace with God through the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. He looked for every other person that he could, but you know what he found out? Nobody had the answer. Now, you can go to the smartest people you know. You can go to the most woke people you know. You can find the most up-to-date political people you can find. And they're not going to have the answer to life's most important question. Let me ask you a couple of them. Where did you come from? Look to the world to get that answer, and you're going to get a very confusing answer. Why are you here? They don't know the answer to that question. And where are you going? Do you know this book can answer those questions so simply? God puts you here to have a relationship with him, and where you're going is decided by what you do with Jesus. You can be familiar with him. You know about him, but have you personally received him? Well, Belshazzar said, I'm looking for any other answer I can get, but none gave him a satisfactory answer. He tried in desperation, but then he also looked down to verse 29. 
toward the end now, when he actually gets his answer, the prophet's going to come tell him what the thing means. Then commanded Belshazzar, and they clothed Daniel with scarlet, put a chain of gold about his neck, and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. You know, he's going to call for God's prophet. He's going to look for the right person to come, and finally the prophet gives him the answer and says, I'll tell you what it means. And he gives him the interpretation, and he said, whoever gives me the answer, I'll make him the third ruler in the kingdom. So Belshazzar has just been told, your kingdom is going to be gone in hours. You're done. It's over. And when he gives him the answer, he makes him the third ruler in the kingdom. He sounded like you think, well, good, he must have believed it. He must have thought it was true. He basically is using this like a diversion. You know, there's plenty of people who say, well, I'm not against God. I'm not against the Bible. I believe religion's okay in its place, and I think Christians have a part, and all of this is perfectly fine. But that gives them a little solace in their soul, even though they personally have not received Christ. Do you know when you stand before God, God's not going to ask you, how did you treat other Christians? He's not going to ask you, were you, did you hate the church? Were you an atheist? The question is, what did you do with my son, the Lord Jesus? Now, he just had this little diversion. I remember back years ago, there was a man I knew. I um, worked at a little grocery store. And it was one of these places in the community where men would hang out, probably to get away from their wife. I'm, I'm not sure, but they just kind of hung out at the store. And they'd come after work and just, you know, uh, sit around and eat crackers and things and talk. And one of the guys that came, had been there quite a bit, I knew him. And these guys, in talking to him, I was actually, about the time I had been there for years, but now I'm getting to be a late in teens and God's already called me to preach. And I had talked to this guy a little bit about the Lord and so forth. And I had a friend there. And we both knew that, you know, we were Christians. We knew he wasn't. Well, come to find out, we heard the report one day that Johnny had had a heart attack. And boy, it shook him up. They didn't kill him, but it shook him up. When he got out of the hospital, next Sunday or so, he was in church. Well, we were all amazed because the man, he'd never been to church. And so we got to talking about it because he had gone to this church that another person I knew was familiar with. And he told me the story. He said, oh, yeah. He said, we were surprised that it was a small church. He said, Johnny came in and said, do you know, boy, during the invitation, he bawled. He broke out crying and just walked forward into church and got saved. And he said his wife did too. His wife followed him up there and both of them got saved. Well, of course, we're thrilled. Wonderful. Man, isn't that a blessing? Well, Johnny went to church for two or three weeks. His heart got a lot better but his spiritual life didn't improve at all. Now, he was scared, and he wanted some solace, and he had a religious experience. But I spoke to him about it, oh, I don't know, a year later, just kind of in I didn't assume he wasn't saved. I just thought maybe he's just not doing well, not going to church. Kind of made a statement to him about when he got saved, and I could tell by his response, like, oh, yeah, well, I'm better now. My heart attack's gone. I'm, I'm okay now. Now, his wife actually did get it, Got genuinely saved, thank God for that. But he illustrates to me what is very true, what is, happens very often, is somebody gets scared, and for a moment they want a religious experience. But having Jesus is more than a religious experience. Now don't get me wrong, it's not difficult to be saved. In one moment you can humble yourself before God, you ain't got to be in church. You can turn to Jesus right now where you are, in any place, at any time, and he's anxious to save you. But he's not there just as a convenience. You see, uh, Belshazzar said, oh, give Daniel a gold chain. Yeah, make him third ruler. Hey, that's fine. No problem. Sounded good. Strike the band back up and let's keep the party going. But it was a diversion. The writing is still on the wall. He still hadn't responded to the writing. He hadn't done what God called him to do. Now, there was a feast. He just blew it off. Now there's a finger. But now let me point you to the faithfulness. Because there's a prophet involved in this story named Daniel. Now, I go down to verse 25. And notice the, the prophet now is going to be called for. But here's his message. In verse 24, he says, This was the part of the hand sent from him, and his writing was written. And this is the writing that was written. Mene, mene, tekel, you farsen. And this is the interpretation of the thing, mene. 
God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Basically, your number has rolled up. Tekel, there are weighed in the balances and are found wanting. You do not meet God's standard. You've come short. Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes. Now, you know, when I think about the testimony of this prophet, where did he come from? How did he show up? Why is he here now? Well, look back to verse 11, if you would. Nobody had the answer. Nobody knew what to say. Nobody knew what this writing meant. And so the king is told by the queen, his mother actually, told by the queen mother that there is a man who lived in the days of your father that could tell you what this writing meant. And in verse 11, there's a man in thy kingdom and whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And in the days of thy father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, was found in him. Whom King Nebuchadnezzar, thy father, the king, I say, thy father made master of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers, for as much as an excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding, interpreting of dreams, showing of hard sentences, dissolving of doubts, were found in the same Daniel. Now, Belshazzar calls for Daniel. And when he comes, he says this in verse 14. I've even heard of thee that the spirit of gods is in thee, and that the light and understanding and excellent wisdom is found in thee. Now, the queen mother, nor Belshazzar, knew God. But they knew somebody who did. Because Daniel had been a testimony for years in that city. You know, God has called us as believers to be a testimony for him. Amen. Our job is to be faithful. You say, was Daniel a failure? Nebuchadnezzar did get affected by it. Later on, there's going to be Darius, who of course is going to, when Daniel's thrown in the lion's den, and Darius himself seems to know God, Daniel had his influences. But he also had his failures. They really weren't failures, because he was faithful. Now, Belshazzar never received his God. The queen mother never received his God, but they knew there was a faithful prophet. And you know, we've got a job today in this world. God's messengers is his church. His believers, those that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the message is set in stone. That is God's word. But the messengers are us. It is our job to give it. And when I think about Daniel, here's Daniel. He's 80-something years old. He's tucked back in a closet. Nebuchadnezzar had exalted him, but now things have changed. And you know, there was a day in America where Christians were highly respected in fact, so respected that people often would become a Christian just because it was respectable and part of the culture. But you know now the, the sentiment of the political winds is not popular to be a Christian. The FBI targets certain areas of believers and uh, even to be branded a terrorist, and there's nothing popular about it. People think if you're really a Bible-believing, sound-preaching church that stands for the Word of God, that you're just old-fashioned, stick in the mud. And even if you're at a church, you've got to be in one of these uh, modern, go-along-with-the-culture, do-everything-the-world-does type church. You say, well, what do we do? You stay faithful. Daniel stayed faithful. He didn't call for just the astrologer to come to tell him what he wanted to hear because they really did not have an answer. Now what about all the... How come he had never met Daniel? You know why he never, never met Daniel? Because he had plenty of astrologers and magicians to tell him what he wanted to hear. There's plenty of folks that could tell him what he wanted to hear, but when it came down to it and he really needed the truth, he called for Daniel. Now we don't have a monopoly on the Word of God. Don't think for a moment, Tri-City Baptist Church or even Baptist have got a monopoly on God's Word, but believers in the Lord Jesus do. The world is not a steward of this book. Believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we do have a responsibility to be doctrinally sound. And then you do narrow the field down very much. And then when you get truly doctrinally sound, you do become a Baptist. And when you get even better Baptist, you believe like I do. But anyway, no. No, the fact is, the truth is God's truth. Amen. We have to give that truth to people. It is our job to give it, and when people really need help. I've heard testimonies from people <clears throat> who said I was lost. I didn't care anything about it. I had a guy on my job. He witnessed to me, told me about God. I did turn him off, wasn't interested in hearing. But boy, then I had this tragedy to come in my life. I didn't call for my drinking buddies. I didn't call for the false doctrine church that had rock concerts. I had a friend that knew God, 
And I wanted to find out what he had to say about it. And I'm just telling you, I've heard testimonies like this. I mean, God uses his word. So he brought Daniel back up. You know, when you look at this country, people like John Wesley, George Whitfield, D.L. Moody, R.A. Torrey, we come on up closer to our time, people like Oliver B. Green or Bob Jones Sr., uh, Billy Sunday, our country has been far more impacted by those men preaching the Bible than any politician that's ever lived. I mean, our country has been transformed by the preaching of the Word of God and kept where it is today more so than anybody who's ever been voted in. So Daniel was brought back up. He's a testimony. But then notice his tenacity. How would you like to be put in a position now? You're standing before the highest ruler in this kingdom, basically the king, and he says, these men have, can't figure out what this thing says. Can you tell me what it says? Now, Daniel could tell him what it said without coming on quite as strong as he did. He could have said, well, mene means numbered. Tekel means weighed. And Perez means divided. So, uh, Belshazzar, um, perhaps God is trying to tell you something, you know, a number. Uh, you know, you can take that any way you like, because after all, it's open to your interpretation. Just ever how you feel about it's fine. Or perhaps you would look at the word weighed. Maybe God's telling you that you're getting a little too fat and you need to take off a few pounds. I mean, who knows? No, he didn't cut to the ch- He just said, let me tell you what God's trying to tell you. You know, anybody can take this book and say, well, you know, we can just kind of take our own interpretation of it, make it say whatever you want it to say. God didn't really mean that. When Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man cometh unto the Father but by me, that's clear. It's Christ or hell. It's him or no other way. He provided a way of salvation. And our job is not to be belligerent, not to be hard to get along with, certainly not to be holier than thou, or to think we're somehow better than anybody else. We are simply sinners that got saved through Jesus, and we want the same for you. Now, Daniel just stands as a prophet. Think about his message. Mene, your number is rolled up. The Bible says in Romans 14, 12, so then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. You know, I was in the seventh grade, and I first time this really, I remember this happening as a young boy. I went to school on Friday. Derek Acock sat right next to me. I was Bailey. He was Acock. Knew him well. Talked to him. Came back on Monday, and the teacher got up and says, Class, we're sorry to tell you, but Derek was crossing 301 Highway this past weekend. Got hit by a car, and Derek's dead. He's 12 years old. That impacted me. In the eighth grade, there was a boy I did not know as well. We had a large eighth grade school that all the elementaries came into. It was a big school. Went to school home on uh, Friday, came back on the following weekend, and somebody, the principal, got up and announced, we're sorry to inform you, one of our students was out swimming at the beach, jumped off a pier, and they never found him. And, of course, by the time they found him, he was drowned, and 13 years old, he was dead. I'm in the ninth grade. Kurt. A friend of mine that went out to school with, again, I go to school, come back from a weekend, and I, my friends are telling me, did you hear about Kurt? Yeah, he was riding his four-wheeler, ran out in front of a car out in the four-wheeler, Kurt's gone. I mean, I could tell you a few more stories. Somebody says, well, that's anecdotal. I mean, anecdotal means, you know, yeah, you can tell me about somebody who died at that age, but I can tell you a hundred other people that didn't, that lived to be 80-something years old. That's what anecdotal evidence is. You say, well, that's just an anecdotal example. Okay, let me give you some empirical evidence. 100% of the people who've ever come into this world die. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after death, the judgment. At some point, mene is going to be written on the wall for you. Now, that death can be like God says. He has uh, pleasure in the death of his saints, that we saw are not as others that have no hope, That we can look forward to a resurrection and being with God for all eternity. Or it can be after this, the judgment, and it not turn out so well. Mene. He said, Tekel, you've come up short. Well, do you know all of us have come up short? 
Belshazzar was told that day, I have weighed you in the balance and you've come up short. Do you know some people believe that when they stand before God, God's going to take all their good works and put it on this side. He's going to take all their bad and put it on this side and maybe stick it in an algorithm or put it on a scale. And if it comes out that you've done more good than bad, you'll make it to heaven. Most people that believe that believe they're probably going to be okay. But let me tell you what God's going to weigh you against. He's going to take all your works, the good, the bad, and the ugly. He's going to put it on one side, and he's going to weigh it against the righteousness of his perfect demand. He demands perfection. He demands zero sin. Let me tell you how many of us have failed. 100%. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous no, not one. You say, preacher, you sure act like you're sure you're going to be in heaven. How could you be? Because it's not based on my righteousness. It's based on his. I believe what he said. If I receive Jesus, I get his righteousness. And our job is to go to a world where everybody's in the same shape. God says your number has rolled up. You're too light. And then he says your kingdom is divided. Now, part of that is there is a medio persian but it's going to be stripped away from you. And let me tell you, God has told a world today about a division. Let me use a different word. He's told us about a separation. That is, you're going to be separated from God for eternity. Matthew 13, 50 and 51, at the end of this world, the angels shall come, sever the wicked from among the just, and cast them into a furnace of fire. That's a separation. Matthew 25, 41, Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. That's a separation. See, the point is today as a believer, we have a message. The message we have is not an awful message that everybody's going to be lost. The message we have is everybody, if they're willing to trust Jesus, can be saved from that fate. I've experienced it. Most of you have. That's the message we take. Now, Daniel had to deliver an ominous message because this man had turned it down and turned it down, and now the hammer's going to fall. I heard a message years ago from J. Harold Smith, an old preacher of old time, and he gave an illustration that's uh, just really an, an, uh, an amazing thing that took place, and I have no reason to doubt that it did. But he was preaching a sermon one night, and there was a young couple on the back of the uh, church. And he was burdened about them because he noticed they were messing around and you know, they'd listen a little bit and then they'd kind of distract one another. During the invitation, he invited people to come to Christ that needed to be saved. And he sensed that they were interested. They, they, they were, they were uh, uncomfortable and he thought, boy, I know they need to be saved. And he didn't do this very often, but this particular night, he felt very strongly. Everybody's head was bowed. He went down back to the back row and he spoke to this couple. And he said, son, the Holy Ghost told me to come back here and tell you that God loves you and that he wants you to receive Jesus. Just mentioning it to him. The boy turned and said to him, you and the Holy Ghost. And he told him where they could go. I can't even repeat the phrase. Told you and the Holy Ghost and told him where to go. The preacher backed up. He felt that God said, get away from him. He, was amazed. he just was taken back. He went back to the pulpit. That boy left the service, and within an hour, he and the girl both were killed in a car wreck. Now, again, there's plenty of folks who've walked out of a service that didn't die. But would you want the last words that you ever said to God before you breathe your laugh is, no. Well, you don't have to, because when he calls, you can respond. When Jesus reaches out, you can say yes. When the Word of God comes, you can take it into your heart. What will you do with Jesus? And as a believer, what an exciting thing to be the deliverer of God's message. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, we're going to pray. Why heads are bowed, eyes are closed, while no one's looking around? You know, perhaps you're here today without Christ as your own Savior. You may know.